Coming up on DTNS, China's antitrust case against Google, Facebook and Instagram integrate messaging, and all the new Google announcements. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, September 30th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about uh, voice control of televisions, going back to the old Google TV and the Xbox One uh, and all kinds of good stuff. You get that wider conversation on Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google Meet will extend its policy that allows users to host calls longer than 60 minutes at no additional charge. The feature was set to become paid again on September 30th, but has been extended to be free until March of 2021. So anyone with a Gmail account can make calls up to 24 hours long for free over Meet until then. Google isn't extending free access to other paid features like limits on number of participants. Apple's iOS 14.2 will include new emojis from Unicode 13.0 approved earlier this year. The new emojis include a smiling face with a tear, pinched fingers, two people hugging, a transgender flag, a disguised face, lungs, and more. I'm going to be using that disguised face. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> Apple and Epic have agreed uh, that the case about Fortnite should be tried by the court, not by a jury. Uh, Apple had filed a countersuit requesting a jury, and in an earlier hearing on this case, the judge had recommended a jury trial as more likely to hold up on appeal. Uh, but no, the case is expected to go to court for a bench decision sometime in July 2021. Samsung's 4K laser projector is available in two models, a 120-inch projector with 2200 ANSI lumens and a 30-watt 2.2-channel setup audio goes for $3,499 and 130 inches 40-watt 4.2-channel audio and 2800 lumens for $6,499. Samsung calls them ultra short throw, which means they can both be set up right next to the wall that they project onto. Both models have the Tizen OS and voice control by Amazon or Bixby. They're available now, shipping October 16th. Cloudfair announced free web analytics on Tuesday, a competitor to Google Analytics. The Cloudfair product offers near real-time and user behavior without tracking site visitors across the internet. Cloudfair does not use IP addresses to serve web analytics. Uh, it is meant for companies that do not need to add uh, uh, do ad retargeting and want core analytics without compromising user privacy. Cloudfair Web Analytics is available to paid customers at no additional charge and will come to all users in the coming months. Sonos filed a lawsuit in the Western District of Texas, the Western District, not the Eastern District, of Texas, accusing Google of infringing five patents on wireless audio in the Nest and Chromecast products. The patents cover features like controlling streaming music from a device like a phone, automatic speaker EQ, speaker group management, and zone scene presets. Uh, Sonos, you may recall, also has a separate patent case against Google, currently in front of the U.S. International Trade Commission, and also filed in California federal court regarding more basic wireless audio functions like setup, playing in sync, and creating stereo pairs. Streaming music controlled by a phone, quite the patent. I have a patent on saying that, sorry. <laughs> GitHub launched a code scanning tool Wednesday so developers can identify vulnerabilities in their code before they get deployed to the public. The new feature comes from GitHub's acquisition of code and Anal analysis platform, Semly, from Microsoft last year. Semly said at the time it would make its code QL analysis engine available natively across all open source and enterprise repositories. All right, let's talk about that Facebook, Instagram, Messenger reunion. Not a reunion, just a union. Yes, a unified. Let, let's do that. Facebook announced it will let Instagram and Messenger, that's to say Facebook Messenger, users communicate across the two apps. Instagram users will be given the option to add Messenger, which will give them access to Facebook friends, as well as feature things like chat color, emoji reactions, co-watching videos, and disappearing messages. Uh, ephemeral messages. We love those. Instagram uh, users will not need a Facebook account, and users with both Messenger and Instagram accounts will have separate inboxes on each platform. If that sounds confusing, we'll get to that in a second. Instagram users also get privacy controls, uh, deciding whose messages go in a message request folder and who can't reach them at all. A new, let's see, a new accounts center lets users manage these cross app features and others like single sign on and eventually Facebook pay. Yeah, so 
uh, you will be able to message people who are on Messenger from Instagram, and you'll be able to message people on Instagram from Messenger. If you have both accounts, you won't see messages sent to your Messenger account in Instagram, nor will you see messages sent to Instagram in your Messenger account. That makes perfect sense. <laughs> right? Doesn't it, though? Yeah, I mean, it's like, what? <laughs> what in the heck? Where are these all going? I, this is... So I am a... I am a Instagram DM person that uses it once a month, maybe, you know, and it's always somebody trying to message me and maybe I'll uh, engage with them. Maybe not very, very rarely do I message with friends that way, but it does happen. Same thing with Facebook messenger. So the fact that the two would be a little bit more in sync, I'm not mad at that, but I, I, I would, I'd be curious to know who out there is like, Oh, this is awesome. And here's why, because I feel like I'm not I am I'm not really the yeah the the, if, the person who's who's going to make the most of this new feature. If you don't use both, this makes perfect sense, right? No, there's nothing weird about it. It's I can message my 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 nephew is on Messenger. That's how we talk. He's in Australia. He's not on Instagram. So if I was using Instagram all the time, I'd be like, oh, I can message Ben from here, right? Sure. It only gets weird when you're like, but wait, why? Why can't I get messengers in both inboxes? And that's because they are keeping the products separate. You are a different person on Instagram to Facebook than you are on Facebook. If they let you have a unified inbox, you'd all be complaining about the fact that they're like, right. oh, they're merging all yeah. this data together. Antitrust. So they're trying to pay, play, pay attention to that. Yeah. Yeah, you made a really good point on the show this morning that it, it feels like you and I are the same with these things. We just don't use Instagram messaging for anything. I get stuff yeah, from my yeah. kids I don't see for six to 10 months. And they always chew me out for it because that's their platform of choice and all of that. And we got a little bit more into the conversation about, you know, we're seeing Facebook creep their Facebook accounts into a lot of products right now or seeing a lot of crossover happen that we didn't usually when these things were a little more autonomous from each other. Um, this makes sense to me. It makes sense that Google wants to continue to brand in that direction. And maybe that helps some people understand where they're at or what they're doing. But I can tell you right now, my son was angry when I told him just last week that Amazon owns, or excuse me, Amazon, Facebook owns Instagram, and he just cannot deal with that fact. Well, so. and I think that's a really good point, is uh, especially with the younger set, a lot of Instagram uh, direct messages are happening. You know, whether you do it or not, whatever. But with the younger set, that's definitely a thing. A lot of those people don't have Facebook accounts because they're like, yeah, Facebook, you know, it's like for the olds. But it's all the same company. Yeah, and they're going to bring WhatsApp into this, but... I don't think they're bringing, you know, Google Meet into it or anything like that. So Reuters sources say the China State Council's antitrust committee is considering an antitrust investigation into Google over its Android platform. The investigation reportedly is in response to complaints by Huawei that Android's market position causes extreme damage to Chinese companies. Now, Huawei is blocked by the U.S. government right now from using Google's version of Android. And a source said Huawei has used this to show that losing access to Android causes a loss of confidence and revenue. So they're saying, like, look at their market position. The fact that we're not allowed to use them almost blocks us from the market. That's how dominant it is. That's antitrust. China would look to Europe and India for examples of antitrust actions against Google. Europe has decided one. India is considering one. And we're expected to get one from the United States probably later this week or early next week. Here's the weird thing, though. In China, Chinese companies don't use Google's version of Android. They only use it on their products that are outside of China. And no one in China uses most Google services. There's a few ad services that run in China, but that's it. There's no Google search. There's no Gmail. So... Yeah, like the loss of confidence and revenue. Like, I mean, you know, let's focus on that for a second. It, it, what What is the argument exactly? The argument is we sell outside of China and they're abusing their market position in such a way that if we can't use them, which we can't because we're Huawei, uh, we're out of the game. But I don't know that China gets to regulate outside of its borders, so I'm not sure how they make the argument that that's a problem when it's, not even Within. allowed to use Android yeah. from Google in China. Yeah. I mean, this is posturing, right? This is this is this is a little tit for tat. This is China saying, "Oh, you're going to do that to Huawei and ZTE and TikTok and and WeChat." Well, we're going to come after Google. I'm just not sure 
how much effect this would have. No, it's it not a, a big target. It is a over little there. perplexing. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, Xiaomi said. is allowed to use Google, so presumably they could affect Xiaomi's use of Android somehow. Maybe try to make it legislated to make it cheaper or something. I don't know. Well, something you also might know <laughs> about if you uh, if you if you're an independent freelancer working a lot, Bloomberg obtained an internal em email showing that Cyberpunk 2077 developer CD Projekt Red told employees that six-day work weeks would be mandatory ahead of the game's November 19th release. Now, studio co-founder Marcin Iwinski had previously told to Kotaku that the studio would have a non-obligatory crunch policy. Crunch meaning, you know, crunch time, right? Everybody's working real hard. In the email, CD Projekt Red studio head Adam Badowski said, quote, I know this is in direct opposition to what we've said about crunch. He also added, we've extended all other possible means of navigating the situation. Cyberpunk 2077 was delayed from April 16th to September 17th, and then again to November 19th. Yeah, the big hang-up here is crunch is a known quantity across the industry in a way that's really acute right now. Like, in the last couple of years, it's all anybody wants to talk about uh, from a sort of, this industry is maturing, we need to do better at how we treat our, our our employees, maybe even accepting some unionization in a couple of cases, um, which really doesn't exist in the games industry. A lot of these studios will release a gigantic 200-person produced game that costs millions to produce, and as soon as it hits the street, even if it's wildly successful, they'll lay off almost that entire team. That's not unheard of. In this particular case, we're not talking about that. We're talking about this sort of cramming toward the, toward the end, and a lot of people don't understand how it works in terms of why is there so much cramming toward the end of a video game's uh, product cycle. And that's a difficult answer because it's very complicated, but basically it doesn't matter how many times you push your release, there's always something else to be done or do, be it feature creep or something you had to cut out entirely, or, well, we have an extra month now, we can maybe add this, but that adds new complications. So before you know it, you're in a situation where now we're really locked in on the November date, we're a year later than we plan to be with multiple dates that have all been missed in between. Like at some point, we either have to do this now or we go another year. And if they're going to do it now, well, then they got to do all hands on deck. The big problem and the reason people are mad is that they came out and acted all progressive in this regard and said, look, we're not going to force it. We're not going to make crunch right. part of our company culture anymore. And we're going to lead the way in that regard. And then this memo says, nah, but maybe not right now because we got a huge game release coming up. And, and it is. We're all so stoked for this game. I'm beyond out of my mind excited about Cyberpunk. And I have been since it was announced uh, years and years ago, five, six years ago when they announced development on this thing. I was so excited. So I'm ready. Gamers are ready. We want the game. We also want it done right. Uh, my guess is this is like every other game before it and maybe too many after it where crunch becomes a thing because that's the business, that's the industry. Whether they're helping their employees manage those uh, that extra time, do they get paid time and a half or whatever the equivalent in Poland is, I don't know. But it's a little concerning that they would say, we're going to do this, and then they don't. They do the other well, thing. Well, they're a progressive studio that tried to do the right thing and then found that it was impossible in right. this situation, right? And you're right. It's not that all of the other game studios aren't doing crunch. They are. It's just none of them called attention to it. Uh, right. And I, I find it really interesting. In the 19th century, it was a fight over getting paid for overtime. In the 20th century, it was a fight over getting paid enough for overtime. Now it's a fight over work-life balance. This isn't even about pay. This is about, hey, I shouldn't have to ever work a six-day week. That's not good for me. So it's it's progress in labor relations, if nothing else, and it's very interesting to watch. It's, an, it's also another, there's another angle to this, which is um, a tired programmer, a tired artist, a tired animator are not good programmers, artists, and animators. And I guess this is true of any job, right? Any job where you're just working to yourself to the bone, you're not going to be the most effective part of the, you know, that cog in, the, in that set of cogs and wheels. And at some point, there is going to have to be some sort of reckoning. Like, what what is acceptable? What isn't? There's a certain number of 20-somethings who are happy to program till 6 a.m. No problem. They'll sleep overnight and then start all over again at 8 a.m. and get two hours of sleep. They're okay with it at this stage of their life. Well, you move on, and you got kids, and you got families, and you're trying to do other <laughs> things with your life, and you got to account for that. And this business, 
doesn't know how to do that yet. So yeah, there's a little bit of ageism involved. In yeah, that too. yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll get there. Uh, let's talk about this Twitch. You know, Twitch, they stream things. They unveiled a new product called Soundtrack Wednesday. <laughs> Sorry, Soundtrack. It was released on Wednesday. Letting streamers play music while they're live. So this is interesting. If you've been following any of this stuff about, you know, videos getting pulled down and that sort of stuff, and especially muted streams. If music is copyrighted, streamers can't use it while streaming unless they have the rights to those songs. And even then, it's kind of hard to prove that you do. Uh, however, Twitch can't do much about the fact uh, that it's being played live, okay? So they can't do a lot there. But if viewers make clips from the broadcast or they're looking at the VOD, the video on demand of the stream, and it's left online, then streamers get into copyright trouble. Uh, usually a strike will happen or other stuff happens where they get pull downs, whatever. Uh, sometimes you can get a permanent ban on Twitch, which is a real bummer. So Soundtrack is a separate app that interfaces with streaming software like OBS, Streamlabs OBS, Twitch Studio, possibly some other forks of OBS, uh, not sure about the, I forgot the main competitor to OBS, but anyway, the paid one, I'm not, we don't know about that for sure. But anyway, it separates the music stream into its own channel and broadcasts it separately. Okay. So that Twitch can automatically strip the music from the VOD of a live stream at the bottom of the stream. A widget will display what song is currently playing and updates live. If the artist has a Spotify page and a Twitch channel, those links get displayed as well. So it's a really interesting as Roger put it in pre-show, out-of-the-box sort of thinking on how to deal with copyright strikes on a platform known for two problems. One, people just playing their music that they want to play during their streams and hanging out with their community and having that stuff get strick stricken. Or sometimes video games themselves will have copyrighted music in them that the service and or copyright holders don't want to hear in this format. They don't want to see that stuff streamed, even though I think that's ridiculous. It should just be default. But Roger, anything to add to that? I thought you made a really good point about that. Like, you know, this this whole thing is it's been a long time coming and it's an interesting way of dealing with it. It's uh, I mean, it's unique in that this is they're literally making it a separate thing that goes alongside parallel with your your stream. So given the option, they can take out the music without necessarily impacting your content that you've recorded and people can still see, right? If it's actually part of your VOD, part of the video file, that means if they need, if there, there's some sort of uh, a strike against the content in it, like the, the audio content, they would have to take out the whole thing. In this case, they could just take out the soundtrack. So you wouldn't have cool spiffy music, but you wouldn't necessarily lose eyeballs because that stuff would still be there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so basically I, they're just also, they're you don't it like get, You also don't get punished right. with a strike. Right. If you if you used the system, even if they're like, well, you had the rights to stream it live, but we need to remove it from the video on demand. You are you are fine. They're like, but you did have the rights for live. So that's OK. Whereas where you get the strikes is like you didn't have the rights for live or on demand. So now you've run afoul of the rules. You're right. And this and the important aspect to this, just to mention to streamers who may be even a little bit confused about how they're integrating this into their stream. Think of it as how you already do this with a multi-channel setup with OBS. You've got OBS that can take multiple audio channels, and you can bring something in from, say, a media player, or you bring something in from YouTube as it's playing in the background or whatever. This is just another source like that. You treat it like that audio source. You pipe it through your OBS setup. It's really not going to be hard on your end uh, to do any of that. So I, he, time will tell on this, but I think it seem, seems neat. People seem pretty excited about it. The only the only docs that I've I've read are people saying, "Well, but what if they're talking about the music, but then it got stripped out because it's a VOD version?" If you're a streamer and you're aware of this, you're probably not going to do that as much because you understand that it might go away. You know, if somebody watches it after the fact. Yeah, this is not going to cover every single situation that could arise. This doesn't fix all the problems. Absolutely not. But it fixes some, so it's better. Mm -hmm. Than what yeah. it was before. This is really good for you know pre-roll where you've got some music playing before you get going, or you just want to have something on in the background, etc. It's 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 certainly not going to like you say. It's not going to fix uh, incidental music in video games. It's not going to fix like I now want to do a commentary thing. It's a whole whole different situation. But it's a start. And the more people that can get licensed in here, the wider licenses they can get. Musicians get paid because it's a license situation. So I I think this is a very good step. Yep, I agree. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Google had a very efficient 30-minute infomercial today to announce the following uh, products that we're going to talk about right now. All of these products had leaked 
some to the point where you could buy them at Walmart and Home Depot. But we'll go through the official announcements because we get some extra details now, uh, starting with the phones, the Pixel 5 is a Corning Gorilla Glass 6 panel, 6 inch 2030 40 by 1080 OLED, 1959 aspect ratio, 90 hertz refresh rate. A hole punch selfie camera though, so not a big bezel up there, no big array, but that means no facial recognition, but it is 5G, uh, sub six gigahertz and millimeter wave uh, because it's only using the Snapdragon 765G processor, not the 865, but it is using the integrated X52 modem for 5G. It's got IP68 water resistance, reverse wireless charging, 4,080 milliamp hour battery, 18-watt uh, USB-C fast charging, 8 gigs of RAM, and fingerprint sensor on the back to take place of the face recognition. Here's the biggest feature, $699 to start, available October 15th. Now, if you don't even want to pay $699, you can get the Pixel 4a 5G, which in most ways is more similar to the 5 than it is to the actual 4a. The 4a 5G has a 6.2-inch edge-to-edge OLED screen, Qualcomm Snapdragon 765G uh, processor. So the same chipset as the 5, uh, which is a better chipset than the 4a. It's got a headphone jack, 3,800 milliamp hour battery. The big difference is six gigs of RAM, starts at 128 gigs of storage, and $150 more than the 4A, but $100 or $200 less than the Pixel 5 at $499. Now, 4A 5G is going to launch in Japan October 15th. Eight other countries get the phone in November, including the United States, where Verizon will have their own version available November 19th. Pre-orders on October 29th. The Verizon version will be $100 more, though, uh, <laughs> for, for some reason. Instead of $499, it's going to be $599. Uh, but I think that has to do with the millimeter wave service that Verizon has. It also will come in white. T-Mobile will also carry the phone in the U.S., but no details on that. Both of these phones have three years of OS and security updates. Three years, three months rather, of Stadio Pro, YouTube Premium, 100 gigabytes of Google One storage bundled with new 5G pixels. Both phones have ultra-wide lens, two rear cameras, a 12.2 megapixel main camera with a 77 degree field of view, and both optical and electronic image stabilization, and a new 16 megapixel ultra-wide that shoots at a wider 107 degrees. HDR Plus with bracketing on both, night sight in portrait mode, Portrait light that handles backlight using machine learning can be applied to in editor to old portrait photos. So if you've got stuff you want to you want to make better, that, that that is something that is is handled as well. Also, cinematic pan, which slows down motion with stability. That's cool. Extreme battery saver increases battery life up to 48 hours. Hold for me, Google Assistant uh, alerts you when you're off hold. And uh, this is all coming to older pixels soon. Yeah, so they both have the same camera. Uh, both the 4A 5G and the 5 have the same camera. It's really that RAM uh, storage, battery life, and waterproofing, and and the resolution and, and refresh rate uh, of the screen. If if those are determining factors for you, you might want to plunk the extra couple hundred on the 5. But if those don't make any difference to you, the 4A 5G is your is your phone. Yeah, I think that sounds like a great deal. Um, there's a lot of features in there. By the way, I don't know if this matters, but as an iPhone user, if I was ever to delve into the Android side of things, I always liked the Pixels. Like, this would be the way I'd go. And every time they announce a new one, I get a little tempted to try the other side. You know what I mean? I had the Pixel 4, and I just gave it to, to Roger to use, and it was a fine it was a fine phone. They're good, solid phones. What's very interesting about this is that we are going not very far up from the four. In fact, they're making the Pixel, instead of being a flagship phone, being a mid-range phone at $699. Mm -hmm. Now, you also get that reverse wireless charging uh, with the five. So I don't know how many people really have that much of a of, of a yearn for the reverse wireless charging or you know charge your buds it's a nice perk it. but yeah it's 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 interesting uh and i i think you uh you still get most of the other stuff available on on both models so uh tvz gun said nfc wasn't on the 4a and i'm looking for it and i think he's right i don't think you get nfc which is very odd as well mm. on the 4a 5g mm. 
All right, uh, let's talk about the speaker, Nest Audio. It's uh, a pill-shaped fabric cover from recycled plastic. Verge called it a loaf shape, but you get the idea. 50% uh, more bass and 75% more volume than the previous Google Home. Uh, 19 millimeter tweeter, 75 millimeter midwoofer. Comes in dark gray, light gray, green, pink, or blue. $99, available October 5th in 21 countries. And oh, by the way, the Nest Hub Max, the existing Nest Hub Max is gonna get Netflix. Uh, they made a big deal about how good the audio sounds on the Nest. Uh, definitely trying to take shots at Sonos. They they showed a big demonstration of their already existing ability to do whole home speakers with Nest. That's not new in the Nest Audio, but you could certainly use the Nest Audio for it. Yeah, I like to look at, I like the sound, of, or it's, I don't mean to be ironic, but I like the sound of these on paper as a possible replacement for the Echoes I've got. Uh, do not like the colors though. It's like 1998 or 88 opened up and said, "Hey, come Why to the mall." Why are you afraid of what pastels? What do you have against green? It's pastels, man. It's <laughs> something with pastels. It's like the uh -huh. Easter Bunny had a like mistake. Old iMac stuff. Yeah, yeah, I don't like it. I'm not a fan. I don't know, man. I think the Nest Audio sounds pretty cool. I like the shape. I I know Tom, you weren't a huge fan of the of the spherical Echo uh, that was announced last week. I guess it was. Um, a this is, yeah. Yeah, this this is this is not. I mean, it's not sphere, but it's it's that rounded kind of oh, you know, audio that goes, you know, it's 360 degrees type thing. What's weird about it is that, and you know, I'm an audiophile to a certain extent. I'm I'm a Sonos person, so that's all the stuff that I have. Sonos it has always built itself as being like we're top tier. Um, Apple does the same, but this sounds pretty great, and boy, is the price right. Okay, before we get to the Chromecast, I want to clarify, NFC is available on the 4A 5G. I just confirmed that. So it, NFC on both. That would be really weird if it wasn't. But yes, yeah. it doesn't have the reverse wireless charging that the 5 does. All right. Cool. Tell us about the Chromecast that some people bought last week already. <laughs> right, yeah. If you're a Walmart, you were really, <laughs> really lucky already. Google TV and Chromecast got updates as well. So watch list will let you track what you're watching across services. You can add that from your phone as well. Recommendations for you from multiple services. That's kind of nice depending on what you use. Live events from YouTube TV supported uh, debut. They're de debuting on new Chromecasts. Uh, there's a remote with dedicated buttons for Netflix and YouTube. So if those are the, the networks you're going to all the time, you got little buttons for all those. 4K HDR, 60 frames per second. Support for Stadia coming in the first half of 2021. So not right away, but pretty soon. That can also run as a side load, and it also runs on Chromecast Ultras. Uh, Ultras. Ver the Verge's Dieter Bone suspects that Google TV will interface introducing lag. So yeah, so so Dieter Bone was saying that the reason Stadia isn't on this Chromecast, even though it's on the other one, is Google TV is another interface level on top, and it introduces some lag. Uh, so they probably have to redesign the Stadia app for this one. They can't just use the one that works on the Chromecast Ultra. Scott, you might be excited about the fact that uh, the Chromecast also comes in a variety of colors. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, yeah. $49.99 in the U.S., Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Spain, and the U.K. can pre-order it today as well. Nice. I, no. asked, I asked on Twitter earlier today, I was like, dumb question, but why is something that's designed to be hidden behind a TV coming in an array of colors? <laughs> and people were like, because it's cool. Because when you, you know, buy it, you can see the color. Yeah, and I was like, okay, I just, you know, again, dumb question. No, that's a good Actually, question. Actually, one person said, well, what if I take it to, you know, what if I'm doing a lot of travel and I take it to a hotel and I like, I like what I like? And I was like, okay. I mean, don't know how many of us are doing that these days, but that's a good point. We will again someday, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah that um, makes sense. The big thing with the Google TV and Chromecast is the Google TV. Uh, it's, it is that that interface where, like you said, there's going to be recommendations. It's going to do a lot of machine learning. Try to make it really easy. Everybody's trying to fix the problem of, I want to watch a show, but I don't know where to find it. You know, I don't want to have to go onto an app like Just Watch and find it and then go find the app on my TV. I just want to say, play the show I want to watch. And and so this is Google's attempt to do that. They're, they're putting this more Fire TV-like uh, interface over the top of Android TV and doing a bunch of special integrations that separate their implementation from other Android TV implementations that are out there. 
Well, if you have thoughts on this or anything that we talked about on the show, you should join our Discord if you haven't already, and you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right. Let's thank our folks who are supporting us. Let's let's do that. Master Grandmaster Levels, you are Bjorn Andre, Jeff Wilkes, and Ragnald Ramadal. Thank you all. Thanks also to Scott Johnson for being with us today. Scott, it's been kind of a fun week in gaming news. What else is going on in your world? Well, uh, I have some fun stuff to talk about in gaming news of yore. Way back in the early 90s, you may remember a little game called Mortal Kombat that changed the video game industry forever. We ended up with a rating system. It ended up being a little more self-imposed and not coming from the outside. The government was mad, though, and they held hearings. There was all sorts of stuff going around, and parents were panicking. Well, that, along with other stuff like Night Trap and other games, became the topic of conversation on our latest episode of Current Geek Chronicles, which you can get right now at currentgeek.com, or you can just search for Current Geek Chronicles anywhere you get your podcast and listen to it. Tom and I, uh, with the help of our awesome crack team, figured out a way to talk about these issues in a way that is bite-sized but also super informative. We go deep into when E wasn't always for everybody, but now it is. And also, where's Mortal Kombat today, and why is it so different than it was then, and were we right to be freaking out? A lot of questions, a lot of cool stuff, and I'm looking forward to the feedback on this one in particular. It was a, it was a hard-fought episode, and I'm really glad we got it out there. So if you are interested in said things, go check it out, a deep dive into that whole world over at CurrentGeek.com. Hey, folks, uh, we know some hard times out there, and uh, so we appreciate those of you who can pick up uh, the other folks who can't support us directly on Patreon, one of the perks of being a patron is the Discord. If you're like, you didn't make a big deal enough about the remote on Chromecast with Google TV. It's the fact that you get a remote that's amazing. You can be saying that to me right now in the Discord if you are a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And if you have feedback, please send it to us because we want to hear it. We also want you to join us live if you can, Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>